This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. Godzilla was king of the monsters, and the movie was king of all monster movies. But the Godzilla that Americans have seen is considerably different from the original Japanese movie. In honor of its 50th anniversary, the film has been released here for the first time in its original version. It's much more than a campy or scary monster movie. It's a very bleak, somber film with echoes of the firebombing and atom bombing of Japan and direct references to the perils of radiation probably know the basic story. A giant and angry reptile emerges from the ocean and stomps across Tokyo, breathing fire and destroying the city. The American version of the film deleted about 40 minutes from the original to make it shorter and to make way for new footage that was added to make the film more marketable to American audiences. The new footage featured an American wire service reporter whose reports provide the narration for the story. The reporter was played by Raymond Burr, who went on to play Perry Mason. Here's how he opened the film. This is Tokyo, once a city of six million people. What has happened here was caused by a force which, up until a few days ago, was entirely beyond the scope of man's imagination. Tokyo, a smoldering memorial to the unknown. An unknown which at this very moment still prevails and could at any time lash out with its terrible destruction anywhere else in the world. There were once many people here who could have told of what they saw. Now there are only a few. My guest Steve Rifle is the author of a book about the making of Godzilla and its many sequels. It's called Japan's Favorite Monster. I asked him why Raymond Burr's character was added to the American version and why some of the film's message was changed. Well, this was, uh, you know, the mid-50s, a decade or so after the end of the war. I don't think there was a lot of uh, sympathy for Japan, so the underlying message of the film may not have resonated so well with American audiences at that time. That having been said, I don't know that the uh, distributors of the film in the United States had purely political motives. I think they were driven more by capitalism than anything else. And what they uh, did was essentially disguise a Japanese film as an American one. And, and if you think about it, what they did was rather ingenious. They rented Raymond Burr for one day. The story goes that um, they paid him for one day's work and they kept him at the studio for 24 hours in order to film all of his scenes. And they filmed the, uh, everything in a little, uh, on a little soundstage on Vermont uh, Avenue in Los Angeles. Uh, they hired uh, Asian actors, some of whom posed as uh, essentially uh, body doubles for the Japanese actors. They used the over-the-shoulder shots and whatnot to kind of uh, pretend that Raymond Burr was actually speaking to members of the Japanese cast. And they rather effectively, if crudely, incorporated him into the Japanese film. And what it did was it created a very marketable uh, giant monster movie of the variety that was so popular at that time. Now, the ending is really changed in the original Godzilla, the Japanese movie that is being released now in its full version in the States. The movie ends with the paleontologist saying, I can't believe that Godzilla is the only survivor of his species. If we continue testing H-bombs, another Godzilla will one day appear somewhere in the world. What's the ending in the American version? Well... You know, the giant bug, giant reptile, you know, atomic monster movies were extremely popular in the 1950s. I mean, I could run down a list of really wonderful titles like Tarantula, Them, Black Scorpion, Giant Claw, Giant Gila Monster, Giant Behemoth, uh, The Amazing Colossal Man, The Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, and on and on and on. And what was the, uh, the normal pattern in those films? It, it, essentially, in the American atomic monster movies, the monsters were stand-ins for Cold War invaders. And at the end of the movie, there would be much celebration as the American military ultimately defeated these warriors, these monsters, with new and more powerful military might. Often there would be, you know, a new version of an atomic weapon that, that obliterated the monster. And, and the message was clear that no matter what the threat, you know, never fear, the American military is strong and will defend you. And what the American distributors of Godzilla did was essentially, if not completely, attempt to create an ending of, of, of that type. Uh, Raymond Burr's last line of the film was, 
you know, the menace was gone, but the whole world could wake up and live again. I think even in the Raymond Burr version of the film, the rather downbeat and poignant ending still shines through to, to a point. Uh, but in the original version, as you said, uh, it's much more pessimistic. Uh, if, if we continue to test these age bombs, another Godzilla is going to appear somewhere in the world someday. To me, what that essentially means is, in our world, that someday, you know, one of these bombs is going to be used again. And, and if you look around us today, I mean, it, it's never been more true. I mean, we're just a, you know, one accident away from a, a nuclear tragedy. And incidentally, the, the scientist's prediction was correct, wasn't it? Godzilla came back again and again and again and again. And that's why we're here <laughs> talking about this today. Um, you know, watching the movie as, as an adult, I was thinking, well, you know, it's the H-bomb that's responsible for Godzilla, but it's the atomic bomb that was actually dropped on Japan. Um, why is it the H-bomb that the movie is so concerned with? Well, uh, the H-bomb uh, testing program was in full effect at this time, and uh, there was an, an incident in early 1954, the Lucky Dragon tragedy, and this is really the the incident that may have been, you know, the most responsible for the creation of Godzilla. The Lucky Dragon was a Japanese fishing boat that set sail from its uh, home port in Yaizu in uh, January of 1954, and it's voyage was ill-fated from the beginning. Uh, they were originally set to tuna fish in the waters off of Indonesia, but at the last minute the owner of the boat ordered the fishing master to set sail instead for the waters off of Midway because he'd heard that there was great catches of albacore tuna to be had there. So in late February uh, they began fishing there and on the morning of uh, March 1st, 1954, in the pre-dawn hours a few crew members were standing on the deck when they thought they saw the sun rising in the west. And uh, what it turned out to be was an H-bomb test. Now the, the crew of the boat had not been warned that they were drifting dangerously close to the, the Pacific Proving Ground, the uh, the uh, H-bomb testing zone at the Marshall Islands. And uh, even if they had known that they were close to the testing ground, they certainly did not know that a test was going to occur on that date. So as they stood there wondering what the heck this was, a few of the men who had served in the war started to get an eerie feeling, and the captain said, let's get the heck out of here. And by the time they reeled in their nets, they were being rained on with this sticky white ash, this radioactive fallout. And by the time they got back to Japan, many of the men were sick. The radio man later died of leukemia that year. It became a huge uh, international incident. And... Um, in uh, mid-March, uh, after the boat had returned to port, and uh, starting to be, uh, this incident was part, starting to make waves in the press, Tomoyuki Tanaka, the producer of the film eventually, uh, clipped a newspaper article and went to uh, the head of production at Toho Studios and said, what if these nuclear tests, what if these H-bomb tests awakened an undersea creature that came on land and destroyed Japan? And that's really the genesis of Godzilla. There are amazing scenes of destruction in Godzilla. Um, you know, Godzilla in the movie, he's not just a victim of the hydrogen bomb, a victim in the sense that he's become bizarre and radioactive as a result of this, but um, he also is a kind of like metaphor for the force of hydrogen and atom bombs. And, um, you know, he breathes fire and he, he sets Tokyo ablaze. Um, and the, the, the scenes of Tokyo burning are are really disturbing, especially if you're a child watching it. Can you describe how those scenes were shot? Well, the uh, miniature sets of uh, Tokyo, um, in some cases, were so large that they had to be built outside uh, to accommodate the, uh, the width and the dimensions of them. They were basically shot using uh, you know, miniature buildings uh, constructed in 1 25th scale. Uh, and, of course, Godzilla, as we all know, is a man in a latex costume uh, who tramples through the set. Uh, you know, for instance, when Godzilla destroyed the clock tower in the Ginza, that is a very, very accurately uh, detailed model. You know, often people will deride these films for being, quote-unquote, cheap, uh, simply because they do not uh, use the stop-motion animation technique that other giant monster films before them did use. That being said, uh, the, the amount of care and detail that went into the construction of the miniature Tokyo is just amazing. When you witness Tokyo on fire, there's a great 
shot during the middle of Godzilla's long rampage. It was just amazing. The destruction, the death toll is sort of unparalleled on screen. 